It's the dead of winter. The Great Famine is tightening its grip across Europe. Crops have rotted in the fields for three straight years. The roads are lined with the skeletal remains of those who couldn't find food. Entire villages are vanishing from the map. But in some communities, people are surviving. Not because they have more grain, not because they're luckier or stronger. They're surviving because their bodies can do something most humans on Earth physically cannot do. They can drink milk. While their neighbours waste away, these people have access to a liquid that flows fresh even when everything else has failed. Their cattle, huddled in barns against the endless rain, are producing the one food that can be harvested every single day. No planting, no harvest season, no waiting. Just pure calorie-dense nutrition that keeps them alive when everything else runs out. This wasn't luck, this was genetics. 7,500 years ago, a mutation appeared in the DNA of some Europeans. A single change in a gene called LCT that kept their bodies producing an enzyme called lactase. Most humans stop making this enzyme after childhood. Their bodies shut it off because why waste energy on something you don't need? But these people, these lucky few kept, producing it for their entire lives. And that microscopic difference became a matter of life and death. Today, if you're of Northern European descent, there's a 95% chance you carry this mutation. You can walk into any cafe and order a latte without a second thought. You can eat ice cream, devour cheese, drink milk straight from the carton. But step outside Europe to Asia, to Africa, to South America, and suddenly you're in the minority. Globally, 65% of humans lose the ability to digest milk after infancy. For them, a glass of milk means bloating, cramps, and spending the day in misery. So how did this one genetic change come to dominate an entire continent? Why did it spread faster than almost any other mutation in human history going, from virtually non-existent to common in just 3,000 years? And what was happening in Europe that made this ability so valuable that people who had it survived, reproduced and took over, while those without it slowly disappeared? The answer connects ancient migrations, brutal winters and a revolution in how humans lived. It links your morning cereal to the rise and fall of civilizations, and it reveals how a single molecular switch, on or off, determined who would thrive and who would fade into history. This is the story of how Europeans evolved to digest milk, and it's one of the most dramatic genetic transformations in human history. Let's break down what's actually happening inside your body right now, or what's not happening if you're among the majority of humans who can't process dairy. When a baby enters the world, their intestines are already armed with a molecular weapon, lactase. This enzyme is churning away in their small intestine with one singular purpose to shatter the bonds of lactose, the sugar molecule that makes up 7% of mother's milk. Think of lactose as a locked door. Lactase is the key that breaks it open, splitting it into two simpler sugars your body can actually absorb, glucose and galactose. But here's where things get uncomfortable literally. Without lactase, that lactose doesn't just politely pass through your system, it sits there in your gut like an unwelcome houseguest, fermenting. The bacteria in your intestines throw a feast, gorging themselves on this sugar buffet. And what do bacteria produce when they are in excess? Gas, bloating, cramps. And then comes the diarrhea as your body desperately tries to flush out what it can't process. For the vast sweep of human existence, we're talking hundreds of thousands of years this made perfect sense. Why would your body keep manufacturing an enzyme after you've been weaned? Once you stop drinking your mother's milk at age two or three, lactase becomes evolutionary dead weight. Your body is efficient. It doesn't waste precious cellular energy on tools it doesn't need. So somewhere around early childhood, a genetic switch flips. The lactase gene gets turned off. Production stops. And you become lactose intolerant for the rest of your life. This is normal. This is how human beings are supposed to work. As mentioned earlier, around 7,500 years ago, in the windswept grasslands and forests of ancient Europe, something extraordinary happened. Some people developed a mutation, a tiny typo in their DNA, that appeared in a regulatory region called an enhancer attached to the LCT gene. The most common version that spread through Europe is catalogued in genetic databases as CT13910. Those letters and numbers don't sound dramatic, but think of this mutation as someone jamming the off switch on the lactase gene. It never turns off, not at age three, not at 13, not at 30, not ever. Now here's the part that is really interesting. As mentioned before, this mutation didn't just slowly trickle through the population over 100,000 years like most genetic changes. It didn't gradually inch forward generation by generation. 
It exploded across Europe like wildfire. Scientists who study human history have calculated the speed of this genetic spread, and the numbers are staggering. Lactase persistence went from being virtually invisible in the European gene pool to being the dominant trait in some populations in merely a few thousand years. The same script played out on different stages around the world. Whenever humans started corralling dairy animals, cows, goats, sheep, camels, the same crushing evolutionary pressure appeared. Those blessed with the ability to digest milk had such overwhelming advantages that mutations enabling this ability spread through populations like a beneficial virus. This happened independently in at least three different regions of the world, Europe, East Africa, and the Arabian Peninsula. Different mutations, different populations, same end game. The selective advantage must have been huge. But why? What was happening in ancient Europe that made this mutation so incredibly valuable? To understand the rise of lactase persistence, we need to transport ourselves back to Europe between 9,000 and 8,000 years ago. For hundreds of thousands of years, humans had survived by hunting wild animals and gathering whatever plants, nuts and berries they could find. Life was nomadic, precarious, and lived at the mercy of nature's whims. But now something fundamental was changing. Agriculture was sweeping across Europe like a slow-motion tsunami, carried by migrants from the Fertile Crescent in the Near East. These people brought seeds, farming knowledge, and most critically domesticated animals, sheep with their warm wool and adaptable nature, goats that could survive on terrain nothing else could graze. Communities were transforming from mobile hunting bands into settled farming villages. They were planting crops, yes, but these animals became the cornerstone of survival. These creatures provided meat when you needed protein, but they also provided something that would prove even more valuable, a renewable resource that didn't require slaughter. Even as they milked their cows and goats, most of them couldn't actually drink what they were producing. They were sitting on a nutritional gold mine they couldn't access. Think about what milk actually represents from a survival standpoint. It's a liquid that's absolutely packed with calories around 150 per cup. It's loaded with complete proteins containing all the essential amino acids your body needs. You just need to keep your animals alive, and they'll produce nutrition year-round, month after month, week after week. For communities struggling to survive in the harsh northern climates of Europe, this was nothing short of miraculous. This created the most intense selective pressure imaginable. Over dozens of generations, the mathematics of survival did their inexorable work. But here's where the story gets even more fascinating. Scientists today have developed the ability to read the DNA of people who have been dead for thousands of years. Ancient bones buried in forgotten graves can have their genetic material extracted, sequenced and analysed. When researchers examined the DNA of early European farmers from around 8,000 years ago, people who were already keeping cattle, already milking them, already dependent on their herds, they discovered something shocking. These people couldn't digest milk. The lactase persistence mutation was essentially absent from their DNA. Despite living alongside dairy animals, despite presumably trying to consume milk, they didn't have the genetic equipment to process it effectively. This tells us something crucial about the timeline. Dairy farming came first, the genetic adaptation followed. This makes scientific sense. You need the environmental pressure in this case, the presence of milk as a potential food source before natural selection has anything to select for. But then, around 5,000 years ago, something dramatic happened that would accelerate the spread of this mutation across the continent. From the vast steppes of Eastern Europe, those endless grasslands stretching from modern-day Ukraine into Russia, a people called the Yamnaya began to move. These weren't farmers in the traditional sense. They were pastoralist people who lived with their herds, following the grass, mastering the art of surviving on livestock. And they carried something in their DNA that would reshape Europe forever. Yamnaya had extraordinarily high frequencies of the lactase persistence mutation. Their ability to thrive on dairy wasn't just a minor advantage, it was central to their entire way of life. And wherever the Yamnaya people settled, the genetic landscape transformed. Ancient DNA studies paint a vivid picture of this transformation. This gives us hard, irrefutable proof of how rapidly beneficial mutations can spread when the selective advantage is strong enough. As these migrants interbred with existing populations, they passed on this genetic gift to their descendants. And because those descendants could now fully exploit dairy as a food source, they thrived. And the cycle accelerated. But the impact went far beyond individual bodies being able to process dairy. Lactase persistence enabled entirely new forms of civilization. 
crops can fail, hunts can come up empty. This reliability meant communities could support larger populations in smaller geographic areas. You didn't need as much land per person if dairy was providing a significant portion of calories. This led to what archaeologists and anthropologists call the Dairy Revolution in European prehistory. And we can see the physical evidence of this revolution buried in the ground. Archaeological sites from this period reveal a sudden explosion of specialized dairy equipment. Pottery designed specifically for processing milk appears everywhere. We're not talking about generic cooking vessels. These are purpose-built containers for specific dairy tasks. There are vessels with perforations perfect for draining whey from curd surly cheese making equipment. Containers with distinctive residues showing they were used for churning butter. Storage jars designed to keep dairy products fresh. Scientists can actually analyze the residues inside these ancient pots using chemical techniques. They can detect milk fats absorbed into the clay thousands of years ago, telling us exactly what these vessels were used for. The evidence is clear. These communities were developing complex dairy-based cuisines and technologies. They weren't just drinking milk straight from the animal. They were experimenting, innovating, developing entire culinary traditions around dairy. And those traditions persist today. Think about the importance of cheese in French cuisine, the hundreds of varieties, each with its own protected designation of origin, each representing centuries of accumulated knowledge. Think about butter in Scandinavian cooking, the rich cultured butter that's central to everything from pastries to fish dishes. But here's something fascinating. Lactase persistence didn't spread evenly across Europe. The mutation reached its absolute highest frequencies in northern and central European populations. In some Scandinavian communities, over 95% of people are lactase persistent. Same in British populations. Same in Dutch populations. Nearly everyone can drink milk without issues. But as you travel south, the picture changes dramatically. In parts of Italy, Spain and Greece, lactose intolerance becomes much more common. You'll find communities where 40%, 50%, even 60% of people can't properly digest dairy. This geographic pattern isn't random, it's telling us a story about how survival pressures varied across the continent. As mentioned earlier, the evidence suggests that dairy farming was most crucial for survival in northern climates. Why? Because northern Europe has longer, harsher winters and shorter growing seasons. The summer months when crops can grow are limited. The winter months when you need stored food stretch on forever. Meanwhile, in the warmer Mediterranean climates, you could grow crops for more of the year. Olive trees produce year-round. Fig trees provide fruit for extended seasons. The winters are milder, the growing seasons longer. So the selective pressure for lactase persistence was weaker in southern Europe. The mutation spread, but never achieved the near-total dominance it reached in the north. But there are some fascinating exceptions to this pattern that reveal even more about European history. Take Sardinia, the large Mediterranean island off the coast of Italy. If you just looked at a map, you'd expect Sardinians to have similar lactase persistence rates to mainland Italians, somewhere around 50 to 60 percent. But they don't. Sardinia has much lower levels of lactase persistence than you'd predict. The same pattern appears in some populations in the Balkans, unexpectedly low rates of the mutation. These aren't flukes. These exceptions are telling us something important about migration patterns and isolation. Sardinia was somewhat cut off from the major migration routes that crisscrossed Europe. It's an island, obviously, but more than that, it wasn't on the main path of the Yamnaya migrations. The people there had less contact with the waves of pastoralists carrying the lactase persistence mutation westward from the steppes. As a result, the genetic mixing was less intense. Sardinians maintained more of their original genetic makeup, including higher rates of lactose intolerance. Some Balkan populations show similar patterns, though for more complex reasons. These regions were crossroads of multiple migration waves, but they also maintained distinct cultural traditions around food and farming. These regional differences reveal something profound. Genetics and culture are inseparably intertwined. It's not just about having the right mutation sitting in your DNA. It's also about having the cultural knowledge to use dairy effectively, the technology to process it, the animals to produce it, and the environmental conditions that make it valuable. All of these factors had to align for lactase persistence to reach high frequencies. There's also evidence that different waves of migration carried the mutation across Europe through various routes and time periods. As we discussed, the Yamnaya people who migrated westward from the steppes around 5,000 years ago had sky-high frequencies of lactase persistence. As is evident from genetic data, coastal populations and island communities often had less contact with these inland migrants. 
they were literally and figuratively insulated from the main currents of migration. Geographic barriers, mountains, seas, marshes, could slow or stop the flow of genes from one region to another. European countries with high frequencies of the lactase persistence mutation became and remain major dairy producers on the global stage. The Netherlands, Denmark, Switzerland, Germany, Ireland, these nations built entire industries around milk production, processing and export. But this isn't just because they had good farming conditions or advanced technology. It's because their populations could actually benefit from consuming the products they were making. What did you think about this deep dive into lactase persistence? Were you surprised by how much this one genetic change influenced European history? Did you know that the same evolutionary process happened independently in Africa and Arabia? And if you enjoyed learning about human history and genetics, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe for more content like this. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.